These are difficult times. Uh, I can tell you as I go around the country or as I did uh, events in my riding um, that people are concerned about the state of the world. The Canadians I speak with are very frustrated with their own lot in life, their own challenges that they face, the affordability crisis that they have endured for the last two years. Mark Carney joined the Liberals, Andrew Scheer trolled Trudeau's caucus, and Mark Holland tried to tell everyone that everything's fine and nobody pays attention to the polls. Sure, Mark. Let's take a look. Today, the Liberals announced that Carney will serve as chair of Trudeau's task force on economic growth to help craft policies to boost Canada's lackluster productivity numbers. Conservative House leader and former leader Andrew Scheer came to Nanaimo to predict the caucus retreat will do nothing to change Liberal fortunes. It doesn't matter what kind of paint they slap on the Liberal brand. Nine years of Liberal policies have done this. Mark Carney won't change that direction. So far, most MPs are saying, at least publicly, that the party is unified behind the Prime Minister. So, Mark Carney, the prodigal son doesn't return, but he just moves a little closer. And the interesting thing is all we've been hearing from Christopher Freeland is that, oh, well, I talk to Mark all the time. We have conversations all the time. And then you'll also hear that Trudeau has been going to Mark for years for advice. So it's interesting that they have now made Mark Carney a special advisor. So if they've already been using him as an advisor, what's going to change? <laughs> What's going to change is he's uh, on the taxpayer's payroll now, isn't he? Or is that party payroll? Well, it's going to be tough to see because I don't think they can like like hire him as a government special advisor. Well, I guess they, I guess they can. Um, but I don't know if this is going to be the liberals paying him or... Or the government, or the payment. taxpayer, because the government doesn't have its own money. If I were, if I were to guess, I were to guess, it's not going to be the liberals, but. But we don't know. Yeah, we don't know that, but I'm sure everybody can can guess. Anyhow, so it's it's an interesting move, and I don't know why Mark Carney would agree to this. No, we've been racking our brains about this all evening, like. Why would Mark Carney come on to the Liberals in any capacity right now? Right. Like, like, why would he tarnish his name with this Liberal brand that's going down in flames? Yeah, because anyone who is going down with them is going to be associated with that. So if even if he's a special advisor, he's going to be linked to Trudeau losing the next election. The other possibility um, is that he's somehow some way going to run and I, I like but that's I don't even believe that um like this boggles my mind now some people will say well you know he's uh he's he's has really good financial acumen and everything like that yeah I see the benefits to the liberals to have him there but I don't see what's in it for Carney unless Carney's gonna say well you know doesn't matter i'm doing this for canada could be and maybe that's how he kind of breaks free of this caricature i suppose that the conservatives are trying to craft for him carbon tax carney that's the one so anyhow um it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds uh, word is that uh, carney and freeland are going to be speaking tomorrow so uh, we'll hear more about what they have to say from the people on the ground there. But um, anyhow, let's move on to Mark Holland, who decided to join Vashi Kapilos on Power Play. And if you believe what uh, Mark Holland says, everything's just great. Two-time Central Bank Governor and longtime Liberal Mark Carney is taking on a new role with the Liberal Party of Canada after a summer of speculation over whether he'd replace Christian Freeland as Finance Minister. Announced today, Carney will chair the Leader's Task Force on Economic Growth, a move that comes as he's set to address the gathering Liberal Caucus in Nanaimo, British Columbia. It's the first time Liberal MPs have huddled together since the surprise and significant loss of their long-held Toronto St. Paul seat back in June. Earlier today, I spoke with Health Minister Mark Holland just before he left Toronto for that meeting. 
Hi, Minister. Good to see you as always. Thanks for making time for the show. You bet, Fashi. I have a number of questions related to your portfolio, most particularly dental care, but I did want to start off asking about where I know you're headed, caucus over in Nanaimo, uh, BC. One of your colleagues, Julie Dershowitz, told CTV this weekend, quote, we're worried, worried, pardon me, given the end of the deal with the NDP, given the resignation of your campaign director and given public opinion polls. Are you worried? No, uh, no, I'm not. I think that uh, my focus is on uh, the business of being uh, Canada's health minister, and I think our government is focused on the same thing, uh, which is making sure that we help people and that we're focused on governing. Uh, look, things go up, things go down. Uh, I think for me, I you know, was there in 04, 06, 08, 11, 15, et cetera, so forth. Uh, this will be my eighth federal election. Uh, you learn to uh, not get too invested in these ups and downs. You stay focused on what you were elected to do. Uh, and we were elected to uh, serve Canadians and get things done, things like dental care, pharma care. So that's what my focus is. Uh, and I don't for, sort of focus on the, these up and down machinations. So he doesn't focus on the ups and downs, but I mean, this time for this the Liberals, there's down. been no ups. <laughs> it's been a constant down for that's the last right. two years. And, uh, you know, he, he just wants to pass this off. Oh, oh, not worried. Nobody's worried. You guys are panicking. Really? Let's let's <laughs> let's 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 ask some other people, Mark. One Liberal MP from Quebec says she's heard from her constituents and they want Trudeau to go. My constituents want a change in leadership. That's very clear. Uh, I don't. We were aware that we were going to have a few years that we were going to be rough, but I think that the, the economic situation is turning in, in Canada. But privately, Liberals are nervous, especially now a week away from a crucial by-election in what was once considered a safe seat in Montreal. One possibility the Liberals are reportedly considering is temporarily proroguing Parliament this fall, then laying out a new set of priorities in a throne speech. But if it can't get support from at least one other party for the speech, the government would fall and Canadians would be heading back to the ballot box. So we hear this proroguing Parliament rumor again. Um, doesn't mean there's a lot of legs to it, but they've talked about it. So what would that mean? Well, as we've talked about on our live stream uh, on Sunday, um, and you can catch that in the live section of our channel uh, towards the end of the stream. But what that essentially means is they would officially end the session of the current government and then begin a new session. So it doesn't mean that the government falls. It just means the session closes. It's kind of like a break. Yeah. Yeah. And the byproduct of that is any legislation that is currently not, you know, not passed not completely passed is dead in the water right so anything that hasn't received royal assent it just stops it dies and that's even like if you have a bill that's gone through third reading in the senate and it's getting ready for royal assent but has not received royal assent yet it's done so it's possible that trudeau kind of gives the finger to jag meet singh because pharmacare is still in the senate it has not passed fully yet so if he prorogues Parliament, the Pharmacare bill that they've like worked so hard on is done. done. Um, so wouldn't that be a, a kick in the teeth to, to Jagmeet Singh? But um, that could also give Jagmeet Singh his campaign platform back. So, you know, that's a possibility as well. Um, the other thing that proroguing Parliament does is it stops any and all investigations happening in committee. It doesn't stop RCMP or police investigations, but it does stop the internal committee investigations. So that's something else that they're considering. Now, what happens after they come back from a prorogued parliament is there is a throne speech. And after that speech is delivered, the House then needs to vote as to the confidence that they have in the government based on that speech. So that's a confidence vote. So it's going to be really interesting to see what ends up happening here because that that's quite the gambit because that could take them to an election. Yeah, it could. And if the Liberals are looking to avoid an election and they're no longer in a confidence and supply agreement with the NDP, there's no guarantee that that throne speech is going to be supported. So if they're looking to avoid an election, this may not be the way to go. Right. So um, from what we've heard... Um, we haven't heard there's any concrete information that there will be a prorogued parliament. So we're just going to be waiting and seeing, you know, if, if that happens. Um, 
but um, you heard it from from some of these reporters that they're talking to liberals inside caucus privately and everybody is shaking in their boots because one other thing that we learned today is five more chiefs of staffs of liberal ministers have resigned today so you have everybody jumping out of the windows of the building that is the liberal government because they're just like i i'm done i'm not going down with this anymore some of those people had been thinking for a while allegedly and some of those people had just said you know what okay ndp quit our, our, our national campaign director quit. I'm, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. So things are not looking great for Justin Trudeau and his liberals. But uh, let's get back to optimistic Mark Holland. I think if I were asking you this a year ago, I, I would totally understand where you're coming from. There was not a persistently wide gap between your party and the Tories. It was not as sustained, not nearly as sustained as it has been over the last eight months. My guess is that's what's informing Ms. Dershowitz's comments, right, about her worry is that this isn't the, the normal up and down. It's been like that for a while. And it also leads me to wonder or, or sort of assume that Canadians, even though you're governing, don't feel that that governing is effective. Is that fair? Well, no, I, I think, look, these are difficult times. Uh, I can tell you as I go around the country or as I did uh, events in my riding, um, that people are concerned about the state of the world. Uh, they're very, it's very heavy times. Uh, and so uh, it's understandable that there's a lot of frustrations there. Uh, and what Mr. Polyev has done is, is leaned into that, pressed into the pain, made people feel more uncomfortable. Uh, and he's good at that. Uh, but that's not uh, choosing the direction for a country. That's not choosing the kind of country we want to have. And I think when people take a look at it, who would Canada trade its place with? Uh, Canada is, is in a very difficult global time doing very well. Uh, and we have to have a really important conversation about the choice that's in front of us. Uh, right now, Canadians haven't been focused on a choice. They've been focused on frustrations with the world writ large and understandably frustrations about the challenges that are here at home. But when those get focused into a conversation about what kind of government you want to have, what kind of policies you want to have, what kind of folks do you want, uh, focusing on what kind of issues, uh, that's one where I feel very comfortable. And in the conversations that I've been having with people, uh, very easy to get to a place where um, uh, where I see uh, our way to being able to get support. But I mean, I, I think the focus again is in the wrong place. If you're focused on polls, um, then you're missing the, the fact that you have an opportunity to be getting things done and to govern. And that's what my focus has been certainly as health minister. The gaslighting that's going on here. Right. Oh, you know, it's a, it's tough in the world right now. And, you know, it's tough at home because of things that are happening worldwide. Uh, no. I mean, how long are you guys going to use that excuse? Well, and, and they keep saying, well, you know, Canadians are frustrated with what's going on in the world. So that's why they're angry. No, no. People are angry because you've made it twice as expensive to fill up their tank when they go to the gas station. People are angry because there's either missing food in the food aisles or the food is twice as expensive as it used to be. Yeah, I'm angry because I'm paying eight bucks for a stick of butter. And people are angry because they can't afford their homes anymore and people are moving into tents. I heard a story today of a 70 year old lady who lost her home and she's had to move into a tent. Like this is... This isn't right. Like. These sorts of things should not be happening in Canada. And nine years ago, before the Liberals got into government, things like this did not happen in Canada. Well, and this is what ticks me off when these the, these Liberals say this. They're, they're like, Canada is doing great. And it's like, define great. Because if you're going to sit there and, and spout off, well, you, we have a triple A credit rating and yet, like, not going to have it. And he says, oh, the people I talk to, the people you talk to are probably just other liberals in the Liberal Party, in your caucus. You probably don't even talk to regular Canadians. We've got some very big things to get done, things that I'm sure we're going to be talking about in a we moment. Will, yeah. Yes, we will. And I have questions about that. Just one more question on this, because I do take your point about, um, you know, focusing in as the Conservatives have done on those frustrations. But I'm not sure it's as simple as saying it's just frustrations with the way of the world right now or the state of the world, as you put it. The Canadians I speak with are very frustrated with their own lot in life, their own challenges that they face, the affordability crisis that they have endured for the last two years. 
don't these polls show something different than you're intimating? Don't they show that people, though you, you say you are governing, don't feel that that governing has led to better conclusions for their life? And shouldn't you take something from that and provide them maybe with a different agenda, a, a bigger agenda, more change, rather than what you and your colleagues keep telling us, which is you will continue doing what you're doing? What we've done is break the country. So we're just going to continue doing what we, we've been doing, which is breaking the country. Well, and what's worse than that is they'll break something like food affordability, for example, Canadians are having such a tough time buying groceries that children are going to school hungry. And the Liberals go, you know, instead of repealing the carbon tax to make groceries less expensive, um, let's, let's spend more money to create a school food program. Like they're not fixing it at its root cause. They're just slapping a bandaid on things and pretending that they're heroes. Well, and um, in, in Shear's press conference, he talked about some metrics that were released from the, I believe it was the Canadian Trucking Association, and they did their own math because they're not going to be listening to the Liberals either. And the carbon tax has cost the Canadian trucking industry, just the trucking industry, $2 billion. And that's expected to go up to $4 billion by 2030. That's insane. And that's, that's $2 billion in carbon tax that gets passed along to Canadians. So don't be telling everybody that, oh, everything's fine and you get more money back and you know don't pay attention to all the outside costs of the carbon tax. We don't want to talk about those. So, you know, this is, this is the deal. But, you know, they continue to say, well, we're just going to continue to, to do what we've done. You know what? Be my guest. Don't listen to the results of the Toronto St. Paul's by-election. Don't listen to Canadians. Don't listen to anybody. Listen to your elite selves that you know, know better than all the other Canadians, allegedly. You'll find it right quick when it goes to the polls. Well, look, I think in the first order, I acknowledge fully that the times we're living in globally are very difficult. They're probably the most difficult times since the Second World War. Um, but uh, in that, uh, we have to look at what real solutions are rooted in data and science and evidence. And, uh, you know, and, and I think when you take a look at the Conservatives as an example, they've offered no policies, no ideas. All we know is they're going to cut uh, and cut tremendously across the board. Um, but that doesn't you absolve your government from position, questions about what you're doing. No, absolutely I not. agree. But, I would but, love but them to look answer at, that But question. take a look, Vashi, take a look at how Canada's doing. Take a look at how Canada's doing in terms of job, job creation, in terms of the our unemployment GDP, rate is up. in terms of our... It, it is. GDP but, but you per take a look capita at it, is it's still up. very... <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can't just slide through those talking points with Vashi. She will call you on your garbage. Like, oh, uh, you know, job creation, yeah, unemployment rate's up. Uh, oh, uh, yeah, it, 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 it is, but, you know, GDP, well, GDP per capita is, down. is, and it's been declining for years under Trudeau. And here's the thing. Freeland loves to say, well, interest rates are coming down, and that means our economic policy is working. Wrong. Wrong. What's really going on? Because they're, you know, the banks have analyzed this. Interest rates are coming down. And one of the direct reasons why they're coming down is a result of our GDP. So the interest rates are actually coming down to try to help prevent us from sliding down into a recession. Well, and the interesting thing I had read, I don't recall which article is, but I will try to find it for you guys and throw it in the description. They were saying that Canada's increase in population has like helped us artificially avoid a recession. Yeah, because you have more taxpayers. Right. So, but that's only going to stem the tide for so long. Because you have all these new people buying roughly the same amount of goods. That increases the price of those goods. And increases the prices of everything. Because supply and demand, simple economics. Um, so, this is the issue. 
This is the issue. So I'm glad he was called out on that stuff. No, but, but if you take a look at how we're doing versus the rest of the world across a myriad of economic indicators, Canada is doing exceptionally well. Now, that's in very difficult global times. Uh, you know, you could take inflation. Canada has got one of the lowest inflation rates, and I believe it is the lowest in the G7, one of the lowest in the G20, and below all the averages of the G20 and OECD countries. So we're doing very well across a number of metrics. But the question here is, Look, it's very easy. I've been around this business a long time. I was in opposition. Going around and hammering the government and saying everything that's wrong in the world is very easy, and you can get a lot of points for it. Here's the problem. You're going to have to come and have a conversation about solutions. How are you making things better? And I would say to you that whether or not it's on housing, whether or not it's on affordability, whether or not it's on health care, uh, that we have concrete plans that we're working through. And I think that you have to stick to the business of getting things done and delivering results. I think trying to find magic wands or trying to you know herk or jerk here or there to try to uh, to try to change the narrative isn't the way to do it the way to do it is to get results the way to do it is to do things like what we're doing with dental care 650,000 people getting care over 80 percent of dentists now are uh, participating in the program making sure that we make pharmacare happen that we get diabetes medication to people so these are the practical things that I'm focused on I'm very comfortable having a conversation in six months, a year time, about how what we've done and are doing is different than just the anger and noise that has come from the the opposition. Um, I, I, I love that the liberals seem to think, or... No, Do they they're, think? They're, 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 too, <laughs> they're, they're too smart for that. They know darn well that it's not Pierre going around and riling everybody up. Canadians are already upset. Yeah, um, Pierre wasn't riling everybody up when the trucker convoy descended upon Ottawa. So that wasn't anybody riling everybody up. That was actually Trudeau riling everybody up. Let's get real there. Canadians are tired. You know, we're tired of seeing everything that we work hard for, everything that we earn taken by this government, and they spend it recklessly. I mean... You know, implementing a national dental program or a national pharmacare program would be one thing if we had a budget surplus, but we're in the hole, $60 billion this year alone. And Trudeau has managed to double the debt of every single prime minister before him combined. One guy in nine years, that's insane. Well, and we pay $40 billion per year on debt interest. That's almost $1 billion per week to service the debt. I mean, what could $40 billion buy Canadians? Well, it could buy, what is it? Well, they said the dental care was what, four and a half billion? Yeah, so 10 dental care programs. Pretty much. Or what was the, uh, the, the pharma care program that they want to implement? I think the number was 8.5 or something like that. Like, so five of you, those. You could buy all these different programs for Canadians if we weren't carrying this atrocious debt. But, you know, this and this is the problem with the Liberal governments is they don't care. And they just think that, well, you know, the next government will deal with it. I'm going to retire and enjoy my pension. And then when the next government comes in, usually conservatives, they start blasting them for being fiscally responsible. Right. It's like somebody who can't help but run up a $10,000 credit card debt gets angry when someone takes that credit card away and starts making them budget like and, and calling them a mean and evil person. It's like, well, guess what? You can't live like that. So, you know, let's let's call a spade a spade. The the liberals, they are panicking. They're, they're going to feign this, you know, well, oh, you know, everything's great, you know, Newsflash, Mark. You said, you said, well, you know, it's not about changing the narrative. You have to understand what the narrative is, Mark. And the narrative is that Canadians, they don't think they know that this country is unrecognizable from before you guys took power. And they're sick of it. And they want you out. And the only way to do that is to start fixing the root causes of the problems that are plaguing Canada today. And... 99.9% .9 of them are from your government. So the sooner that we have an election, the sooner we can get your asses out and actually 
dealing with these problems like adults.